For the next few minutes, we're going to talk about the differences between a photographic spectrum and a spectral curve for a star. We'll talk about how you can construct them going from one to the other and the usefulness of one compared to uh, the other. So here we have a photographic spectrum and its corresponding spectral curve for a particular star. On the top, we've got the spectrum, which is the photographic spectrum. It looks uh, like a uh, emission across all the different wavelengths except for certain dark lines. The spectral curve is on the bottom. That's the uh, graph of intensity versus wavelength and we see that uh, there are some colors that are more intense than others, but we also have some dips in intensity throughout. Notice that the dips correspond to the dark lines in the photographic spectrum. And so there's definite similarities here, but there's also some differences. The first question we want to ask ourselves is, what is the physical situation that actually makes this spectrum? Well, we need to go back to our types of spectra discussion, and so I've got some slides on that. This goes back to the third law, or third of Kirchhoff's laws that we had discussed before. And this is that when light is produced by a hot, dense material, or hot, dense object, and that light passes through a cool, lower density uh, cloud of gas, the atoms in that cloud are going to absorb certain colors, but not all the colors uh, that are emitted by the hot, dense object. And so what we get in the end is an absorption spectrum. And that's what we're looking at uh, in the spectrum that we just saw, an absorption spectrum, where certain colors are absorbed, but then we have emission completely in the background. And what type of objects in space are going to give us this absorption spectrum? Well. We have to have something that's hot and dense, and then we have to have something that has a cool, low-density gas either in front of it or around it. Here's the physical situation uh, that we had discussed before. If you're looking at the cloud of gas at the atomic level, then we've got an atom with a nucleus and electron levels, and an electron that will go from a lower level to a higher level. And that's it does that when it absorbs a photon. It absorbs the energy from that photon and moves up an energy level. So what about something like the sun? Well, the sun also produces an absorption spectrum. And that's because it's a hot, dense core surrounded by a low-density outer atmosphere. And we covered this in the Types of Spectra lecture tutorial. Here's what the sun's spectrum looks like. We actually have it broken up into uh, different uh, rows here. But you can see that throughout the spectrum, there are dark lines. And that's because the sun is an absorption spectrum. And it turns out that all stars produce these dark line absorption spectra. The one that we saw in the very first slide was the spectrum corresponding to the bright star Vega. Vega is a bright star that you can see in the summer in the asterism called the Summer Triangle. And if we were to look at Vega through a spectrograph, we would see that it has an absorption spectrum with these particular lines. And if we built a spectral curve, it would look like this. And so let's look at the differences between these two a little more closely. If you wanted to go from a photographic spectrum and then draw a spectral curve, the first thing you need to know is where the dark lines are going to be and the relative spacing between them. And so notice how in the Vega spectrum there are some closely spaced dark lines and then as you go to redder wavelengths the uh, dark lines are more widely spaced uh, occasionally. That same pattern, that same pattern of where the spacing of the dark lines will be, is going to be the same pattern where the absorption dips in the spectral curve are going to be. And so if I was going to draw a spectral curve, the first thing that I would do is find that pattern. The next thing that I would do is determine what the temperature of the object is. And so if the temperature of the star is very high, then that means that the peak 
of the spectral curve will be at a shorter wavelength or further to the left in the intensity versus wavelength graph. If the temperature of the star were very cool or low in temperature, then that means that the peak of the spectral curve would be further to the right or at redder wavelengths. That's something to keep in mind when you draw a spectral curve. Notice that I'd only be able to tell the temperature of the star by looking at the spectral curve itself. I actually cannot tell the temperature just by looking at the photographic spectrum, or at least by looking at the pattern of the lines. For right now, we're going to say that we cannot tell the temperature merely by looking at the pattern or locations of the dark lines in the absorption spectrum. But we can tell the temperature by looking at the spectral curve. And so that's the difference between these two types of spectra. A photographic spectrum gives you the pattern or, pattern or spacing of the lines, and that tells you what type of elements there are in the star. But if you want to know the temperature of the star, the, you need to know what the wavelength of the peak of the spectral curve is going to be. The shorter the wavelength, the hotter the star. And so, uh, just to summarize here, the wavelength of the peak of the spectral curve indicates temperature, but temperature cannot be determined just by looking at the positions of the absorption lines or by the number of the lines. And so, just because there's a bunch of lines on the left part of the photographic spectrum here doesn't mean that the star is hot or cool. It just means, well, it's got those, that particular pattern which corresponds to particular elements that are there.